Welcome to the 447th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. Stay tuned for my interview with Josh Mallerman, author of the novel Bird Box, the novella A House at the Bottom of the Lake, and other works of fiction. Stay tuned for the interview. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Josh Mallerman, author of the novel Bird Box, which was made into a successful Netflix movie. Mallerman's latest work of fiction is the novella A House at the Bottom of a Lake. Josh, welcome to the podcast. Hey, glad to be here. Sure. If someone hasn't heard about your book, A House at the Bottom of a Lake yet, how would you describe it? I I think that authors typically and wisely shy away from analyzing their own work and saying what kind of metaphor it is. But in this one, it's just unmistakable. It's about two teens who on their first date, they go canoeing and they discover beneath the surface of the water, a full, fully furnished home at the bottom of the lake. And so begins a summer of exploring this home as they explore each other and fall in love. And obviously it's no fun and it's not scary if something doesn't already live there. So that's the gist of a house at the bottom of a lake. Great. Do you remember the original impetus or idea that led you to ride a house at the bottom of a lake? Yeah, for sure. I had just started dating Allison, my fiance now. And Allison is from Michigan's Upper Peninsula. And for those who don't know, Upper Peninsula is abbreviated to UP. So if you are from there, you are a Uper. Allison is a Uper. So I went with her a 10 hour drive from our area here in Detroit to where her parents live, uh, way up in the UP. And they have this old, like, Finnish lodge on a lake. And Allison and I went canoeing, and that brought us to a second lake. And then through this graffiti road under, you know, this overpass, through this tunnel made by the overpass that led to a third lake that was much darker, less inhabited and freaky. And we, it was huge and dark. And I said to Allison, I'm like, Oh God, can you imagine if we passed over like the top of a house right now? Like how scary to look down and just see like the roof and it suggests how deep it is below us. And then I was like, and we looked at each other and I was like, yeah, when we get back to the lodge, I'm going to start working on this. That's a great memory. For many years, you were the singer songwriter of the Detroit rock band, the high strong. What led you from songwriting and performing to writing fiction? So we're still together. We're, we've all been best friends since we were like, man, like 11 years old. And by then, I was already trying to write short stories, and which led to really bad poems. And But my friends, they were already playing music and getting really good at it. Derek on drums and Chad on bass. They were already the, the guys in school that were great rockers and that kind of stuff. And eventually down the line, when we turned, and I used to go and watch them play it talent shows and at a party and down the line like when we were around 18 no 19 they were hey you write you write poems you write uh stories like maybe you could write songs and it was like what are you talking about and they bought me this organ that i started playing a few chords on and this sort of led to this complete love affair with songwriting in the strangest way, I was already 19. Then I was like 20. Didn't really pick up the guitar until I was like 21. And then eventually, two years later, we all moved to New York City and I'm the guitarist singer in our band. It was a very sudden thing in my life, but it was presented by best friends and it was an immediately wonderful thing. And I got to say real fast, I think it's it says something about being a late bloomer or a late comer to something is that I, you see a lot of people who maybe are really wonderful musicians, but who maybe they burn out a little bit by the time they're 21, 22. And to have not started till then, it was almost like a door open for me that I'm still excited about now. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so I think that there was some bliss or mercy in being a late bloomer. My, ba- my bandmates still love it. They're, they love doing what they're doing too. But as the writer and as the creative force behind the band, there's two songwriters, me and Mark. And we both started around, yeah, around the same age, like 19. And so how did you get from that to to writing fiction and then having your first novel published? Like I said, I was writing, trying to, that's a key phrase, trying to write uh, short stories and poems and blah, blah, blah. And Mark, the other songwriter, he's also... Um, a writer. And and we would talk all the time about wanting to write novels also, like constantly talked about it. 
And we would have experiments where we would lock ourselves in our apartment in New York for 48 hours. And you had to try to write something of substance, of size, that kind of stuff. Forcing ourselves to try to write novellas, books, blah, blah, blah. And then I tried for years while we were in the band, while we lived in New York, we're on the road, all this stuff for about 10 years. I, I tried and failed at finishing a novel. What that means to me by failed is, yeah, just didn't finish. I think finishing a novel at all is a success and anything on top of that is gravy. Then Mark leaves the band when we're about 29 years old. And, I, and again, this is 10 years of not being able to do this. But then Mark leaves the band. It was like this distressing artistic, emotional experience for me. I'm alone for two months off the road. And I'm like, I'm going to try it again. I'm going to try to write a book again. And I freaking did it. I, I finished one. It's called Wendy. It was this unparalleled experience in my life, man, where I saw the ending coming. I was already on page like 270. You know what I mean? It was so excited, man. Finished it. And I was like, I did it. Oh my God, I did it. I can't believe it. I did it. We go back on the road. And without Mark, now just as a three piece, and I'm starting to think, eh, maybe I should do another one. And I write another one. A few months later, let's do another one. And this is now it's starting to be writing between cities and the passenger seat between gigs, writing at the bar we go to and the cities we go to. And, and before I knew it, I had eight or nine novels done, including Bird Box. And I was posting about it endlessly online. It was just pure excitement. And a friend of mine from high school, this guy named Dave Simmer, gives me a call one day. This is like a, you see this in a Dickens novel or something, this mysterious benefactor. Like <laughs> he, he gives me this call one day and he's like saying, I see that you're writing a novel every few months. It seems I have a friend. He knew a guy who represents a lawyer who represents authors. Would I mind if Dave sent him one of my books? So I'm like, okay. I can't believe, I don't know what this guy, I have no money, no book deal, no agent, nothing. I don't know what a lawyer is going to do with it, but yeah, let's do it. And I'm super excited. And we sent it to him and the guy, Wayne calls me and he's, Hey, I, I would like to represent you. And I know a manager for you. That led to me meeting Ryan Lewis, who I have not, I just got off the phone with, who is my manager of 13 years now. And we're like best friends. We have our own production company, all this, but Ryan and I, and, and his partner at the time, Candace, we got Bird Box into shape, and then we pitched that to Kristen Nelson, the agent, who then shopped it, and Harper Collins picked it up. So from Dave's phone call, it was just the most wonderful like series of dominoes from there. But I have a few things to say about that real fast, because sure, I, mean, I think to like a listener or a writer, you might be like, geez, man, you got lucky. And yeah, no kidding. Dave Collins is like the break in my life. But I was ready for Dave's call. I had nine novels and I, I went through each of them to decide which one to send to this lawyer and blah, blah, blah. And I had stuff to talk to the lawyer and manager about and the agent. And I, I don't love this phrase, but I was armed for the experience. And by the time Bird Box was published, because I decided I would never change that sort of work ethic or process that got me to that spot. So I was still writing two books a year, even while rewriting Bird Box as the first book to come out. So that by the time it came out, man... I had written something like 15 novels or 14, 13, whatever it was. And it's still like that. Now I'm at 33. And and it's I, I, I just I guess I just want for a listener or something to, to think that it, for me it was never a hobby. It wasn't like, yeah, I'm in a band, but I also write. No, it was like I it was a juggling act of songs and books, both with hardcore daily sessions for years before Dave gave me that call. And I think that. There's a lesson in there in a way, for myself included, which is just do it for no reason. You don't have to have a book deal to write your ass off. You don't have to have an agent to do this. If you keep doing it and keep working your butt off and doing it with joy as well as discipline, then something has to come out of that. So I know you haven't published. That's a great story. And I know you haven't published all 33 of those. What's the process there? Do you go back and rework some of those? And are those like... In, in the process to be published? So some of them are. I'm rewriting. The one I'm rewriting right now was only written a couple of years ago. But if you really think about it, because I never changed the process. So it's been about two a year for what's uh, like 16 years, right? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. 
like two a year for 16 years. Because I never changed the process, it's all kind of felt like one experience. In other words, what I mean to say is it's not like there was some early furious run and then a dry spell and then another good run. No, it's been this steady thing the whole time while re meaning writing new ones while rewriting like bird box on Barry Carroll inspection. And I think Mal is Mallory the first time Mallory was the first time where I like wrote one and it came out. Well, no, I guess black man wheel was like that, but where I wrote one and it came out like pretty much immediately after. And, and, it, and it is a bit of um, a mind screw because you, I know when I'm starting a new book that like this, I don't know when this is going to come up. There's as, so what do I have? Nine books out. And there's two more that I know of, three more that I know of that are coming out. So that leaves us with 20 something that are still here. And it's not like those 20 are any worse or any better than the others. It's just, you can only put out like one book a year. So one thing I've done is that I've made a conscious effort to go from, Bird Box was picked up by a big five publishing house, HarperCollins, right? To go from big five indie alternating back and forth this whole time. If I go down the bookshelf, which I can look at right now, we don't have to go through them all, but Bird Box was big five. Then A House of Bottom Lake originally came out with a, a indie publisher in the UK, like a UK website. Then Black Man Wheel, big five, Goblin, limited edition. You see what I mean? Sure, so sure. That has been a sort of method of getting at least two books out there a year. But if you're also writing two new books a year, man, what happens here? I don't know. But I do know that I'm not going to stop that process from happening. Sure. Well, as you were doing that writing, were there writers or books that you that inspired you or that you enjoyed reading as you were doing this writing journey? Oh my God, yeah. I'm still doing it. So I can't underscore that enough. It, it still feels like the same big experience just because sure. Bird Box came out and the movie did so well. Does it, it, that doesn't put a cap to me on like, okay, that experience is there. Oh, no, I hear you. No, yeah, you get it. So the one that really did something for me, man, was Dracula because- I had, I read a, read horror when I was younger and in through high school and even on the road, whatever. But then I went on a bender of like classics where I read Virginia Woolf and William Faulkner and Hemingway and Fitzgerald and Marcel Proust. And I really went on like this bender, Carson McCullers. And it was really incredible also. But that led me to Dracula as a classic. It was like, you, you remember like Barnes and Noble, they'd have the Barnes and Noble classic. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and... So I picked up Dracula. I'm like, oh yeah, man, yeah, let's let's I haven't read this yet. And that book changed everything for me because I was like, wait a minute. This it was like the ultimate combination of everything I was into, which means I know that in its day, Dracula was probably sensational and and, and more of like not a supermarket novel, but sure. I but something happened with Dracula where I saw a combination of a classic and genre. And so you could write a horror novel and it could be as good as War and Peace. You could write a horror novel and it could be as good as um, The Lighthouse, Virginia Woolf. So I, or to The Lighthouse. So I was like, this opened my eyes. That was the most influential in terms of anytime I read a horror novel. Let's say I just read, I know there's a lot of, dozens of brilliant horror novels, but also you'll pick up maybe just a werewolf story. And I would be like reading a real simple like werewolf story and just thinking the whole time, like in the right hands, this could be a classic, this idea for this book. In the right hands, like I started to see horror novels as ideas and platforms and diving boards and this and that. So if you wanted to get lofty or not, or if you wanted to be really elastic in genre or style or not. But something about Dracula opened that door for me. And it's been it's been like this sense of you can do anything since then. Sure. You talked about writing two novels a year. Are you working on something now? Yes. So so. I just finished one like somewhat recently that I'm hoping is the next book for, I finished it like three months ago and I sent it to Del Rey. I'm hoping it's the next novel. We'll see. I haven't talked to them about it yet or they they haven't responded yet, but I am rewriting, dude, this is nuts. I'm rewriting a book I wrote two years ago. That is 1150 pages long. Did you know if you pay your nanny or sitter more than $2,300 a year or $100 a week, you owe taxes? When Care.com HomePay does your nanny taxes and payroll, we make sure to find all the tax benefits you qualify for, up to $8,000 a year. From tax filing to payroll, Care.com HomePay has it all covered. When you sign up for Care.com HomePay, we handle your nanny payroll, W-2s, everything you need. Try our service for free for the first month. Go to HomePay.com to get started. 
And I'm, dude, I have never done something like this before. Bird Box, it's, and House Bottom Lakes, like only, what is it, like 180 pages, right? Bird Box is like 290. This is nuts. I'm on page 79 of the rewrite and there's 360 to go. Like unbelievable. But it's also been this very interesting experience for me in terms of like, putting your money where your mouth is. Like, I'm always talking about like, you do a little each day, the numbers add up, don't freak out, this kind of thing. And I'm like, I'm literally having to tell myself that like every session. Okay, yep, this is going slow today. You do a little every day, it adds up. And here I am at page 790. So it, in a strange way, it's almost like forcing me to face my own advice. Because I'm always saying to a new writer, oh, listen, don't be overwhelmed by the size of a novel. Okay, to a new writer, Bird Box, the size of Bird Box might seem overwhelming. And to me, this one is. Right. And, so, and so in that way, and so there's two things going on where I'm just rewriting a book and ex experiencing that. But I'm also experiencing this sort of Zen concentration where I have to be above the self-doubt, above the freak outs, above the feeling like you're drowning in 1,100 pages. And, and for that, man, it's been super interesting. That sounds interesting. I'm curious, given the fact that you're a songwriter, do you ever have a situation where when you have an idea, you're not immediately sure if it's a song or a piece of fiction? Yes. Yeah. Great question, Jeff. Like, dude, for a long time in the early days of writing the novels, if an idea was smaller, it became a song. And if idea was bigger... It became a book. And a lot of high strung songs, there's one about a grave digger who rearranges all the names and dates to all these impossible lifespans and really weird names. So a lot of the high strung songs have these sort of could be short story, I don't want to say horror, but Twilight Zone y, like bizarre scenarios. And the books are the books. But when Bird Box came out, because of that relationship I had between the two, I had no short stories zero, none, not one. And it was such an odd thing to be putting out a novel and to have a dozen novels, but no short stories. And I was asked by Doug Marano and D. Alexander Ward, these two just brilliant dudes, these editors, if I wanted to add a short story to this one anthology they were working on. And I was like, oh boy. So I did one and it's in the anthology and that opened that door for me. But I still feel like I've probably written like 30 of them now or something. But I still feel like I'm bringing up the rear on that front. I've always felt that, not that I think that they're bad. I don't really think in those terms. But the novel is home. And the song is home. And the short story and the movie script are still like, still somewhat new terrain to me. I know you've talked about um, some of this already, but I'm curious, what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories and novels? The biggest one for me, and, and I'm not really saying this for myself, uh, from my own experience, as much as it is from watching my friends who who have either wanted to write or are trying to write, the biggest one for me is just getting rid of the words good or bad, good and bad. Just get rid of them. Like, it, don't, it, it, it's not even just a matter of you're your own worst critic or this and that. It just doesn't matter in the rough draft if it's good or bad. It doesn't. You're going to rewrite so much that the rough draft just eventually becomes just this like incredibly detailed outline you once wrote. <laughs> and so if you know that, and that after a couple, if you publish a couple of books, you, any, anyone who has, most people will say, dude, the rough draft is like unrecognizable now, right? So if that's the case, what does it matter how good the rough draft is? Get all your ideas down, take chances, make sharp right turns, add a character halfway through, why not? You're going to take the few months afterwards, you're going to go visit it again, you'll know what's good when you read it as if it's someone else's book. So to me, that's the biggest step is to just eliminate the words good and bad. And what it does, if you think about it, okay, Jeff, think about this. Like the, there's a spectrum, right? Of the, let's just say the best book you've ever read and the worst one you've ever read. I think it's safe to say that no matter what if we hung up right now and you went and wrote after this, I think it's safe to say that whatever you write is somewhere on that spectrum. And chances are it's not going to be the worst thing you've ever read. And if it is the best thing you ever read, well, great. Good for you. That's freaking <laughs> awesome. And you know what? Even if it's the worst, spectacular failure is interesting too. So I see it as, I see it as there's literally nothing to lose with the rough draft. And so that would be my biggest advice and to, to not wait for inspiration, to write whether you are inspired or not. I think that you discover later on if you go back and read, you're not going to be, you wouldn't even be able to tell me which days you were inspired if you read it like, you know, two years later. Yeah. 
Well, what novels or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed? Actually, I've been bizarrely, I leapt into the Anne Rice Vampire Chronicles, <laughs> which like I know, like out of nowhere, I had always heard that Lest- the vampire Lestat was like, he becomes a rock star. And I'm like, oh God, like that sounds, what? And then I picked it up the other day and I started reading it and I'm like, oh man, this is good. This is really good. And I'm on book three now. So I'm, also, because I'm doing this giant rewrite, there's something like, what's the right word? Calming about reading the same writer the whole time. I'm just, it, almost the same story, right? A series. It's while I'm rewriting this giant book, okay, I'm reading Anne Rice Vampire Chronicles. Great. That's what I'm doing right now. And, and I, she's really good, dude. Like, really good. And I'm like, there's moments where I'm just like, holy cow, have, have, has everyone read this stuff? But that's the stuff that's been like really, I've been really into. But I've also, I read a ton of, Last year, I, I loved Stephen Graham Jones' new book, The Only Good Indians. I loved, I read a few classics like Red Dragon and uh, something else that was always on my list. And I finally, oh, I read Beloved, Toni Morrison. That Oh, uh, this one, Portnoy's Complaint, Philip Roth. Like books that I've always wanted to read, but then probably because of the quarantine lockdown, I'm finally like, hey, now's the time. It re- I've been on, you know how you go on like good reading streaks? I've been on a really good reading streak lately. Yeah. A lot of people have done that during the pandemic. Well, where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you and your novels? It's just, you. my website used to be somewhat boring. It was just updates. But recently at the beginning of the pandemic, I I wrote a novel, I serialized a novel and posted it like like in real time, pretty much. I wrote it, rewrote it, posted it, that kind of thing. And it was for free. It was essentially because we're all on lockdown and money was tight and I'm going to write the book anyway. Let's just do it. So Carpenter's Farm, a full novel, longer than Bird Box, is on the website, joshmallerman.com. There's only one L in Mallerman. Joshmallerman.com. There's literally an entire novel that now my my manager and I are discussing with people about like the, on the TV side and this kind of thing. So who knows? Maybe something will come from this. That'd be unbelievable, right? A novel that you just posted on your website. But the point is, the website's become more fun because of that, because there's a book there and there's a soundtrack that a, that a guy, Chris Campbell from Atlanta, added a soundtrack that's incredible <laughs> for the book. So the website's fun. Um, I'm also just Josh Mallerman at Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all that stuff, too. That's great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Josh Mallerman, author of the new novella, A House at the Bottom of the Lake. The book is on sale now, so go buy a copy. And Josh, thanks for doing this interview. Oh my God. Thank you. I, I just want to say, not, not that you ever interview people who are ungrateful. I'm extremely grateful that we did this and this is never going to get old to me, man. We're sitting here talking about books and you're doing what you're doing. And I'm doing what I'm doing and I love it. So thank you. That's great. I'm grateful too. This was a, a good conversation. Have right. a good one. You too. Now stay tuned for a brief excerpt from the audio book of A House at the Bottom of a Lake by Josh Mallerman. Read by Taylor Meskimen and Ozzy Rodriguez. Available from Penguin Random House Audio and available wherever audiobooks are sold. It's the best first date I've ever heard of. Amelia smiled big and nodded. Yes, James said, not sure he'd read her right. How can I say no? How can I say no? Canoeing with a stranger? Yes, I'd love to. Both seventeen, both afraid, but both saying yes. James ran sweaty hands through his brown hair, then wiped them again on his apron. This wasn't the first time he'd seen her in his father's store. It was the fourth. My name is Amelia, she said, wondering if he already knew that, if he'd found her online. James he said, and smiled too. And wow, was I nervous to ask you out. Really? She asked it earnestly, but knew he was. The fidgeting revealed that. She was anxious too. Why? James snorted a single awkward chuckle. You know, boy, girl, people meet. I don't know, it's scary. Amelia laughed. It felt good to have a boy ask her out. God, it felt great. How long had it been since she'd gone on a date? And here, at the very onset of summer, it felt... 
natural. A new day, a new season, and a yes to a stranger who'd asked her to go canoeing for a first date. So here's the idea, James said, checking over his shoulder for his dad. My uncle has a place on a lake. You said so, yep. Yeah, but there's a second lake, off the first one that nobody uses. I mean, some people do, but there won't be, like, a ton of speedboats. We can actually paddle right up to the shoreline, to the base of the mountains, and we'll pretty much have them all to ourselves. The mountains. Sounds great, Amelia said, hooking her thumbs into the belt loops of her jean shorts. She arched her back beneath her yellow tank top. She worried she was augmenting her breasts too much, so she slumped. Then she worried that she was slumping. James was even more self-conscious than she was. This being his father's hardware store, he was sure Amelia would have second thoughts if she hung around too long. Is this his future? She might think. A girl said that to him once, asked if this was his future. James didn't want Amelia asking that, didn't want her walking away. If she was thinking anything like he was, she was already seeing a future together, a life rolling out rug-like from their first date. He saw them laughing on the first lake, kissing on the second, getting married in a canoe, Amelia giving birth in a canoe. Saturday, then, she said and for a crazy second he thought she was saying they should get married on Saturday. His cheeks flushed. He became very aware of that. His cheeks. Then his whole body. He worried suddenly that he didn't work out enough, worried that she was going to leave here thinking about the paunch beneath his apron and not the mountains he'd tried to distract her with. And yet he managed a smile, even found some confidence in his voice. Yes, Saturday, 9 a.m. Want to meet here? Here? She looked up and down the aisle of rubber hoses, hose clamps, and bolts. Maybe this was the moment then when she realized the scope of the situation, the job he had, his future. Unless you want to meet somewhere else. I don't care. No, no. Amelia said, attempting to appear casual while worrying that she was being suddenly indecisive in front of him. Here is fine. Here is great. Saturday, nine. James stuck his hand out for her to shake, then realized how awkward that was. Here is great. He brought his hand back just as she reached hers out to shake it. Then she lowered hers, too. Great. Great. They stared at each other, neither certain how to end their first conversation. A Muzak version of a love song from the 1980s played through the hardware store's equally archaic speakers. Both felt the cheese. Bye, James said, then scurried back down the aisle. He nearly knocked a box of garden floodlights from the shelf. He didn't look back at Amelia as he fixed it. Instead, he set out to find a customer, anybody who looked like they might need help. But when he was far enough away from her, he wished he had looked back. He just wanted to see her face once more. Saturday, he thought. You'll see her again. Did you know if you pay your nanny or sitter more than $2,300 a year or $100 a week, you owe taxes? When Care.com HomePay does your nanny taxes and payroll, we make sure to find all the tax benefits you qualify for, up to $8,000 a year. From tax filing to payroll, Care.com HomePay has it all covered. When you sign up for Care.com HomePay, we handle your nanny payroll, W-2s, everything you need. Try our service for free for the first month. Go to HomePay.com to get started. In South Dakota, we're looking forward to exploring new roads and wide open spaces. When you're ready to travel, go great places. Learn more at TravelSouthDakota.com.